next person I want to introduce to you is um, Dr. Jonathan Lundgren. And um, he, he's going to share a little bit of his story, but I think one of, the, one of the things we need to be aware of is that we have a tremendous opportunity here in California because um, he's done a lot of work in, in honeybee research and, and various other six-legged friends and maybe even eight-legged friends of his. And 80%, uh, I believe, of the beehives in the United States come to California for the almond bloom. And uh, it's a pretty important thing, right? Who we got in here for almond farmers? There you go. How many hives do you think are uh, you know, represented in this room? And we have a, a unique opportunity and a unique responsibility to work to promote uh, honeybee health so that not only um, do we do a better job of pollinating our crops, but we also have a better opportunity to uh, have healthy hives and profitable beekeepers that come back next year. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there that our California team is going to look at being able to work on in order to uh, seed various uh, cover crops and those kind of things working with Dr. Lundgren. So. Anyway, um, I'm very glad that he was able to be here, and uh, please, if everyone, please welcome Dr. Jonathan Lundgren. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I'm John. Uh, we run Agdysis Foundation, which is a research facility in regenerative ag. And we run Blue Dasher Farms, so we're also trying to put these practices and principles into play. For those of you who do not know, and this, all of the stuff that we're talking about here is, um, a lot of that is nested right here, our perspectives are nested right here in eastern South Dakota. Okay, so this is our, uh, this is Blue Dasher, this is uh, Ecdysis Foundation's research facility, the first of what we're hoping is many, many. Um, Yes, we want this to be a national network of centers for excellence in regenerative ag. We've got to bring the science up to speed on, on what's going on here. We need to start using science as a tool for helping uh, inspire a revolution in agriculture. Okay. Why? Because uh, this planet is facing some serious problems right now, right? I mean, we hear about these things in the news an awful lot. Climates are changing. Extremes are the new normal, right? I think we went from uh, a high of 10 below to a high of uh, four, daily high of 40 above in a period of about five days in South Dakota. Extremes are the new normal. Human health. Um, in my family, we have uh, five grandchildren out of nine that have uh, severe autism. Where'd that come from? right? Uh, dietary intolerances, um, cancer rates, all of these uh, things we just haven't seen before are starting to rear their heads. Pollution is rampant. You want to know how to really uh, piss a people off? Starve them for a while, right? Declines in biodiversity. What, what all of these issues and probably so many more and what, the elephant in the room is that, is that all of these are, are correlated with how we produce food, all right? Um, our food production systems are contributing to these problems. But not just that. I'm not blaming farmers, okay? What we've got is we've got a powerful opportunity because if those farms are a tool and used as a tool, we can solve planetary scale problems using our food production systems. That's pretty exciting. Biodiversity is in decline. We're losing habitats, especially in our areas. Wetlands are getting drained on a regular basis. I've seen some places in uh, California that should be probably be uh, wetlands right now. Um, where'd the prairie go? Right, it's gone. Um, entire insect communities um, are disappearing. The windshield test. Have you guys heard what about the windshield test? When you were growing up, you, how many times did you have to clean the windshield? How many times do you have to do it these days? We've, uh, science has now discovered that in Germany and in the UK that uh, we've lost about 60% of all insect biomass from the planet over the period of 27 years. 
27 years to lose 60% of bugs. I mean, that touches every aspect of our lives, folks. Okay? It's not a bee problem. This is not a bee problem. I, uh, the, the beekeepers hired me to, uh, or had me come out to give a talk to the National North American Bee Organizations, hundreds of beekeepers, thousands of them. And uh, I got up there and I said, okay, um, when did the bees start dying? And they're like, oh, 2006, 2008. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, how, many, how, many, how much money have we spent on, on solving this problem? Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm like, that's right. How'd your bees do last year? And the room got real quiet because they all died again, right? This isn't a bee problem. This isn't a bee problem. Butterflies, bats, birds, bees, we are losing species at a rate that planet Earth has never experienced before. This is the Holocene extinction event, and it's the worst mass extinction event we've ever seen. Worse than the dinosaurs, folks. What is the problem? There it is. It's not soybeans. It's not corn. It's how we're producing corn. It's how we're producing soybeans. It's how we're producing almonds, right? Agriculture has become far too simplified. And in a simplified system, when you eliminate the biodiversity from a system, the only way that you can replace all of the function that biodiversity used to provide is with a jug, okay? It doesn't matter what it says on the side of the jug. All of these jugs are meant to replace what nature did for us for free. Um, Dr. Ryan Schmid, um, he's our, one of our research scientists at Ecdysis, did uh, for part of his master's, he went out into prairies, pastures, and in cornfields in eastern South Dakota, and we counted the number of species, plants and insect species that were living out there. And what we found is that 25% of what used to exist in the prairie, which is what corn replaced, that's the number of species that we have left. Okay? We're down to a, qu a quarter of what used to be there. Why is that important? Because extinction is forever, right? So not only are we losing species from our cornfields, that doesn't necessarily that we're losing species from the earth, but what we're losing is their function. Because after you eliminate enough species, the ones that remain can't do their jobs anymore. Okay, it's called functional extinction. Really important concept that you never see in the, you very seldom see in the discussion of these things. Is people are like, oh, there's still bees out there. Yeah, but they, yeah, but they're broke, right? They don't know how to work anymore. All right. Biodiversity in the real world. So scientists love studying biodiversity, and so we study things like food webs and stuff. So here's a food web right here. This is a food web in corn that's been studied ad, ad nauseum. Here's a corn plant, and then here's these cute little guys. These are, these are European corn borers. Ooh, should hate these things. Do, you, do I feel the anger rising in the room? These are little caterpillar pests, and they drill into the corn plant, and, um, and they, they burrow in there, they reduce yields, they make the stocks fall over. It's a big problem, because it's really hard to control this pest. So BT corn, which is genetically modified corn that has an insecticide in it, was created in part to kill the European corn borer. And then you've got these little guys here, these little alligators. These are, these are lady beetle larvae, and they like to eat this. And this is uh, called Macrocentris grandii. And so Macrocentris, this is a wasp. Most animals on Earth are wasps by a long shot. Almost every insect species has a parasitoid wasp that stings only it. And so the diversity of insects is then magnified twofold, sometimes greater, by the number of parasitoid wasps that end up making a living on them. And so what this happens is that this parasitoid, she's flying around because almost all of them are ladies, and she's flying around and she's got her, and she's smelling and she's seeing, okay, we're, we're, we found a corn, a corn field. 
And then she starts, she fought lions on us, uh, and she gets her, she gets her antennae going, and so she's smelling with her antennae, and rat -ta 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 -ta. And then she finds exactly on a corn stalk where there is a corn borer living in there. There's no external evidence whatsoever, and she takes her stinger that she doesn't sting people with, she stings other insects, and drills it into the corn stalk and sends an egg down that corn or down that ovipositor that stinger and lays an egg inside of the european corn borer that is then devoured from the inside out it's pretty cool shit <laughs> so that right that that is a food web this is what we understand as the diversity of nature this is an actual food web derived from cornfields in eastern and South Dakota. Every species in here is an insect species, okay? Look at the complexity of this, right? Look at the diversity of species that are out there. You know what a pain in the ass this was to make? A lot, oh my God, this was a lot of work. And that's why it's never been done before. So we think so much when we're thinking about biodiversity, we think, all right, which one's the pest? Which one's the one I've got to control? Which one am I in charge of, right? Let's just say for argument's sake, it's number 55 here. All right, this is our pest. This is our European corn borer. And so let's dump all of our resources into controlling that one species. But what we ignore when we make those decisions is that the only reason that this number 55 is a problem is because it's connected to species that are connected to species that are connected to species. And your decisions right here are influencing all of these other species that are out there. And by disrupting this, you're actually disrupting, you're making pest problems in your fields. You are creating pest problems. All right, so each dot is a cornfield. We find that as species diversity increases in cornfields, you do not have pests. When you reduce species diversity, those are the fields that have pest problems. Okay? When you look at the relative abundance of these things, you want a lot of different species that have the same abundance, that's an even community. When you see that in a cornfield, you don't have pests. When you eliminate it, that's where you have pests. How do you increase Diversity, plants, grow plants, all right? How do you reduce diversity? Buy a jug. Doesn't matter what it says on the side of the jug. That's what jugs do. They reduce diversity. All right, so we've got these. You remember that big old ball of hair I showed you before? This is with the major components teased out. We see that this is a community that has very low pest abundance. All right, look at the connections going on here. It's incredible. This is a cornfield with high pest abundance. Where's all the connections? There's even there's even a pentagram here. The sign of the devil, right? This is evil. What's going on here? Here's California agriculture. What the hell have we done? What have we done? Are we that damn smart that we can produce our food in the absence of biodiversity? Boy pretty bold. Tommy, raise your hand. We have been working on, yeah, <laughs> right after that statement. Thanks a lot, John. <laughs> uh, Tommy is uh, getting his master's degree and he's studying regenerative almond producers. The guys and gals who are on the front edge of this in California right now and who are changing that picture right there. This is, of course, citrus that are bagged so that we don't get those nasty pips in our clementines. 
Um, so looking at folks who are planting things like understories and things like and grazing underneath their almond trees and starting to return biodiversity to their systems and looking at it from a systems approach. He's got a poster that's going to be somewhere that he can show everybody his preliminary research results and he is looking for additional field sites. Um, regenerative almond orchards uh, almost never use pesticides. They integrate livestock. They never till and they're using cover crops in their systems. Um, the alternative is what you saw before where it's basically a scorched earth policy maintained by chemical inputs. Um, we're measuring things like soil health, pest abundance, profitability. We're finding incredible differences in things like insect biomass in these different fields um, and we can't wait to see all of the other aspects of the system. But Tommy can describe that even more in a little while. If you have a pest in your field, that is your field telling you you're doing something wrong. Something's out of whack. Pests are never the problem. Pests are a symptom. And until you solve the problem, which is a lack of diversity, you're going to have to keep on investing in more and more technology to replace the diversity that you've eliminated from your system. Who taught me that? Farmers did. Farmers did. Um, it was a humbling experience, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow, to learn that the farmers are leading the charge on these issues, right? They're leading the science. They're doing things that science says can't happen. Science is used, being used currently to inhibit the, the, the advancement of our agriculture. You know who else taught me was the beekeepers. And what they taught me is they said, John, the pesticides are killing our bees. And I said, no, the data isn't clear on that, right? The data is gray. It's not inconclusive. Sure, there's some studies that show otherwise. And then they said, no, come out here and you watch my bees die in front of the hives right after corn planting or right after they hose them with, an, uh, with a fungicide spray in their almond orchard. And then you tell me that it's not the pesticides that are killing our bees. That's not science anymore, is it, right? That's experiential knowledge. And we used our science to validate what it is that they were saying. And uh, I've got the battle scars to prove it. So we needed to extract our science from the matrix. We needed to get out of the current system. We need to reinvent how science is conducted, where there is no strings attached anymore, so that we cannot be influenced, and so that we are pushing the advancement of, of agriculture, the innovation of agriculture. We're filling a niche that the land-grant system used to provide when it was first, uh, the land-grant university system when it was first created. So, yeah, you'll hear this time and again, I would imagine. Why? Why are you here? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why did you come here? And uh, is it bushels per acre? Is it pounds of almonds per, per acre? Is it pounds of beef per acre? Or is it something more than that? And I hope it's something more than that, because you're in the wrong room if that's the only thing that's motivating you, all right? Um, we are only here through crowdfunding, right? And through donations from people all over the planet. That's how we got started. And uh, I will also not be here if it was not for just an amazing group of enthusiastic young scientists that make coming into work and getting out of bed every day a hell of a lot easier. There's our info. Ecdysis.bio is our 501c3. You can give your money to the government or you can give it to us. Um, and then Blue Dasher Farm. If you want to see our science, we try to make it as transparent as possible. Facebook, uh, Twitter, there's my email. And I'm a minute over. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>